Direct variation. There are two basic types of linear models. The more general model has a non-zero y-intercept. All right, so we know this y equals mx plus b is just the line equation. In this case, b does not equal zero. The simpler model, y equals k times x, has a y-intercept of zero, okay? So in this case, the b is just zero, and y varies directly as x or is directly proportional to x. So these statements below are equivalent. Y varies directly as X. Y is proportional to X. Y equals K times X for some non-zero constant K. K is the constant of variation or the constant of proportionality. All right, so those statements are all equivalent. Example three in pencil... In Pennsylvania, the state income tax is directly proportional to gross income, all right? You work in Pennsylvania and your state income tax deduction is 4605 for a gross monthly income of 1500. Find a mathematical model that gives the Pennsylvania state income tax in terms of gross income. All right, so if we did, if we started with the line equation, y equals mx plus b, We have, we have y in terms of x. They want us to do the Pennsylvania state income tax in terms of gross income. So the income tax is going to be the y and the gross income is going to be the x. Now it says in the write-up that the income tax is directly proportional to gross income. All right, so since the income tax is Y and it's directly proportional, we use the proportionality constant K and that's going to be times X. All right, so Y is the income tax and X is the gross income. Now, we simply have to solve for K so we can have an actual equation, Y equals MX plus B, where B is just zero. So we have to sub in what we were given. Okay, the income tax, we said that's Y, okay, and let's see, so it says here the income tax deduction is 4605, all right, so that's going to be subbed in place of Y, 4605, the proportion, the constant of proportionality, K, we do not know. And X, we said, was the gross income. And right here, the gross monthly income is 1500 So pretty simple. We're just solving for K. All right, so this is K times 1500 The opposite is divided by 1500 So we're just going to do that to both sides. And it cancels here. I'll use the calculator. So I got K is 0 0.0307. All right, so now we can simply um, plug that into the equation. And we see the equation is Y equals K, which is 0 0.0307 times X. And that is your equation. All right, in other words, Pennsylvania has a state income tax rate of 3.0% of gross income. Figure 164 shows the graph. All right, before we go to the graph, we can see the slope is going to be 0 0.0307. All right, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, and the y-intercept is just zero. All right, so there you go. This was the one point that we were given. And we know that the uh, y-intercept is zero, and the slope is 0 0.0307. All right, please pause and try the checkpoint problem here. Simple interest on an investment is directly proportional 
to the amount of the investment. For an example, an investment of 2,500 earns 187.50 after one year. Find the mathematical model that gives the interest I after one year in terms of the amount invested P. All right. So if we start with Y equals MX plus B, we have Y in terms of X. So they want to give the interest I after one year in terms of the amount invested P. So since Y is in terms of X, this is going to be your Y and this is going to be your X. Now it says they are directly proportional. So we know we're gonna use Y equals K times X. All right. And let's solve for K. We have to sub in for Y and X and solve for K. We said Y is the interest after one year. Okay, so this interest is 187.50 after one year. Okay, so that's going to get subbed in for Y. That equals K. And X, we said, was the amount invested. And it says here the investment was 2500 All right, light work solving for K, the opposite of times 2,500 is going to be divided by 2,500. I'm just going to do that to both sides. Cancels here, and I'll go to the calculator. All right, K is 0 0.075. That's going to be the slope. And if you want to complete the equation, you just take that value of K and plug it in. So Y equals... K, which is 0 0.075 times X, final answer. Direct variation as an nth power. Another type of direct variation relates one variable to a power of another variable. For example, in the formula for the area of a circle, A equals pi R squared, the area A is directly proportional to the square of the radius. Note that for this formula, pi is the constant of proportionality. All right, so in this problem here, the value for k is just pi. So for direct variation as an nth power, the statements below are equivalent. y varies directly as the nth power of x. y is directly proportional to the nth power of x. y equals k times x to the power of n for some non-zero constant k. Example four, the distance a ball rolls, that rolls down an incline, incline plane is directly proportional to the square of the time it rolls. During the first second, the ball rolls eight feet. Write an equation relating the distance traveled to the time. All right, so since we're doing direct variation as an nth power, and it said uh, the uh, distance is directly proportional to the square of the time, we're going to do y equals k times x to the power of n. Okay, and it says the distance is directly proportional to the square of the time. All right, so the distance is going to be the y and the square of the time, t, is going to be the x. All right, so I'm going to let um, distance equal d. You can leave it as y if you want. It's still the same thing. And I'm going to let t equal the time. All right, might as well put units too. Um, it says during the first second, the ball rolls eight feet. So the distance is going to be in feet. And the time is going to be in seconds. I'll just use S. All right, so let's see. Distance, we said, was Y. So in place of Y, I'm going to put a D. 
All right, we have to solve for K. And we said the square of the time, time is going to be X. So that's going to be T. And square, that means second power. So T to the second power. All right, and now we can use the info given to solve for K. During the first second, all right, first second, that means T equals one. The ball rolls eight feet, so that's gonna be the value for D. All right, so let's plug that in, D equals eight. K, we don't know. And time equals one in place of T. So that's gonna be one squared. All right, one squared or one times one is just one, so we can eliminate the squared. And k times one, the opposite of times one is dividing by one, but that changes nothing. The ones cancel. Eight over one is just eight. All right, so k equals eight. And if you want to write the equation, you just take the k and plug it in. All right, so D is going to be 8T squared. That was for part A. Well, actually, I'll write the A right here. All right, so there's your equation. Eight, D equals 8T squared. Part B, how far does the ball roll during the first three seconds? Well, that's easy. Now that we have the equation, we can just sub in T equals three for part B. All right, so for part B, D equals eight T squared. So it's gonna be eight, and we're plugging in three in place of T, so that's gonna be three squared. Three times three, or three squared is gonna give us nine, and eight times nine is 72. And we said the distance D was in feet. As long as we use seconds for the time, which we did, the distance is supposed to be in feet. So that's part B. All right, please pause and try the checkpoint problem. Neglecting air resistance, the distance S an object falls varies directly as the square of the duration T of the fall. An object falls a distance of 144 feet in three seconds. How far does it fall in six seconds? All right, so we're still doing um, something that varies directly as the square. All right, so it's going to be Y equals K times X to the power of n, all right? But since it's squared, obviously we know that n equals two. Now the distance s is dependent upon the duration t, all right? So y is dependent on x, so the distance is gonna be your y and the duration t is gonna be your x. All right, so let's see. For some reason, they want us to use S for the distance. Anyhow, I'll write this out. Y equals S equals distance. All right, and we can see they're using feet. So I'll put feet in parentheses. And X is going to be the duration t x is going to be t that's time or duration i'd rather write time instead of duration but anyhow we can see from the write-up the values given that t is the time in seconds all right this s is the variable s and this s means seconds i'm sorry for the confusion but they used s for distance instead of d Anyhow, let's see. All right, so since y equals s, I'm going to sub in s. k, we don't know. 
X is going to be the time T. And it varies directly as the square. So the uh, exponent is 2. Because that is squared. All right. So we just have to solve for K in part A. All right. So the first info we're given, the distance of 144. So that is your Y. And it falls for three seconds. So that, oh, instead of Y, we said S. Let me write S. And the duration of three seconds is the time T. All right. So T equals three. And S equals 144. All right. Plugging in. We're trying to solve for K, so 144 is S. And T squared is going to be 3 squared. All right, so 3 squared or 3 times 3 is actually 9. And we have K times 9. The opposite of times 9 is divided by 9. We're going to do that to both sides. Cancels here. I'll use the calculator. And I get K equals 16. So now we have an equation. You just have to plug it in. All right. So if K is 16, we have S equals 16 T squared. So that is part A. That's your equation. All right. Follow up question. How far? I'll highlight it here. How far does it fall in six seconds? Okay, that's easy. All we have to do is sub in t equals six, because now we have an actual equation. All right, so for part B, s equals 16, and t squared is going to be six squared. All right, just use the calculator, 16 times 6 squared, or times 36, same thing, gives us 576. Now we said the distance S was in feet, FT. So the distance S is 576 feet. All right, in examples three and four, the direct variations are such that an increase in one variable corresponds to an increase in the other. You shouldn't, however, assume that this always occurs with direct variation. For example, if y equals negative 3x, an increase in x results in a decrease in y, and yet y is said to vary directly as x. All right, so they're saying just because x and y are proportional, that doesn't mean they both increase together. One might increase, one might decrease, as is the case when there is a negative slope. Okay, for inverse variation, the statements below are equivalent. Y varies inversely as X. Y is inversely proportional to X. Y equals K divided by X for some non-zero constant K. Notice that K is still in the numerator. However, the independent variable, x, is in the denominator. So for inverse variation, the k is still in the numerator, but x is now in the denominator. So if x and y are related by an equation of the form y equals k divided by x to the n, then y varies inversely as the nth power of x, or y is inversely proportional to the nth power of x. All right, a company has found that the demand for one of its products varies inversely as the price of the product. All right, so let's write that out first since we're dealing with inverse variation. That's going to be y equals k divided by x. All right, so the demand varies inversely as the price. All right, so the demand is going to be your Y, and that varies inversely as the price. That's going to be your X. 
All right, so let's write that out. Y equals the demand. And X equals the price. Now, from the next sentence, the price is in dollars. All right, so the units are in dollars. And the demand is just in just regular units. Okay, nothing fancy there. So we have to use the first sentence or the first sentence with values in it. We have to use this to solve for K. All right, we said the price is X. So right here, X is going to be 625. And the demand Y is going to be 400. All right, and we're just going to solve for K. So 400 in place of Y. K we don't know. And X is $6.25. All right, solving for K, the opposite of dividing by 625 is multiplying by 625. So we're just going to do that to both sides. All right, it cancels on the right, and I'll use the calculator. And I get 2,500 for K. So you want to take that K and plug it in in order to write the equation. All right, so let's see right here. We have Y equals K divided by X, so that's going to be 2,500 divided by X, and that is our equation. All right, follow-up question. Approximate the demand when the price is 575. All right, let's see. So we're plug plugging in a price of 575, we're plugging, plugging in X equals 575. All right, so it didn't say part B, but I'll make this part A and I'll make the follow-up part B. We're going to do Y equals 2,500 divided by 575. All right, on the calculator, I get 434.78, but the products are made in units, okay? So it's probably nearest whole number since they said approximate. I'm going to... I'm going to round up since this number is five or more. That's going to be 435 units. All right, please pause and try the checkpoint problem here. All right, the company example five has found that the demand for another one of its products also varies inversely as the price of the product. All right, so let's start with that. Inversely means that the proportionality constant K is in the numerator. X is the denominator. So demand varies inversely as price. Imani Lee, if you're in the building, can you please come to the main office? Imani Lee. So why is the demand... And X is the price, just like we did in the first example. All right, we want to solve for K. So it says when the price is 275, the demand is 600 units. All right, so price is your X and the demand is your Y. Okay, so Y equals 600. K, we don't know. And X is going to be 275. The opposite of dividing by 275 is going to be times 275. All right, on the right hand side, 275 over 275 cancels. And solving for K, I'll do this on the calculator. I get 1,650. 
you want to take that and plug it in. Plug it in for K. All right, so K is 1650. And I could probably just do that right here. Y equals K, which is 1650, divided by X. So that is your equation. Now for part B, the follow-up question, they want us to approximate the demand when the price is 325. So simple. We said that X is the price. So if we want to find the demand, we just sub it in for X. All right, so part B, Y is going to be 1650 divided by 325. I get 507.69, since this is five or more, I'm going to round it up to the nearest whole unit. So we're just looking at 508 units. All right, pretty simple. Combined variation. Some applications of variation involve problems with both direct and inverse variations in the same model. These types have combined variation. So what would that look like? Well, the proportionality constant K, that's always in the numerator. And the variable that has the direct variation is going to be in the numerator. Okay, and the variable that has the inverse variation is going to be in the denominator. Example six, a gas law states that the volume of an enclosed gas varies inversely as the pressure and directly as the temperature. Okay, so before I get into numbers, let's just do part A and write the equation relating to pressure, temperature, and volume. All right, this is the equation for the combined variation. Again, one variable is direct and the other variable has inverse variation. So it says the volume varies inversely as the pressure and directly as the temperature. All right, so volume, we'll just call that V. So in place of the Z, we'll write a V. And we have our K. And the one that varies inversely as the pressure, the one that varies inversely is in the denominator. So that's gonna be your pressure. All right, we'll use a capital P. And the one that varies directly is the temperature that's going to be in the numerator because it varies directly okay and we'll use a capital t so the temperature capital t is going to be in the numerator and the pressure capital p is going to be in the denominator All right, now we have to use the numbers given to solve for K so we can write the equation. So it says here, the pressure is 0.75 kilograms per square meter when the temperature is 294 Kelvin and the volume is 800 cubic centimeters. All right, so I'm not gonna worry about units too much the main thing here is that the volume is in cubic centimeters and the pressure is in kilograms per square centimeter. So the units match. So plugging in the numbers, the volume is 8,000. So in place of V, I'm going to put 8,000. And we don't know K, so that's going to equal K. The temperature T is 294 Kelvin. And the pressure P 
is 0.75, 0 0.75. Now, in order to solve for K, we just multiply both sides by the reciprocal. All right, so I'm going to take this whole thing here and multiply by 0.75 in the numerator and 294 in the denominator. Okay, I'm going to do that to both sides. All right, over here on the right, 0.75 cancels, 294 cancels. We're solving for K. I'm going to do this on the calculator. 8,000 times 0.75 divided by 294. All right, I get 20.408. In order to write the equation, you want to take the value for K and plug it in. All right, so rewriting with K, we're going to have V and K is 20.408. times T divided by P. All right, you could probably just round to one decimal and say 20.4, but that is the equation. All right, part B, find the pressure when the temperature is 300 K and the volume is 700 cubic, 7,000 cubic centimeters. Okay. So since we want to find the pressure, I am going to solve for P first. All right. So this is our equation that we just made. You can certainly plug in the numbers if you want, but I would rather do the algebra first because we're, we're going to find what the pressure equals. All right, so since we're dividing by P, the opposite of dividing by P is multiplying both sides by P. All right, so I'm going to do that to both sides of the equation. And P divided by P cancels. And solving for P, this is P times V. The opposite of times V is divided by V. All right, so I'm going to divide both sides by V. Over here, it cancels. And now we have an actual equation for pressure. So that's going to equal 20.408 times the temperature T. The given temperature in part B was 300 Kelvin. So the temperature T is going to be 300. And the volume V given in part B was 7,000. So this whole thing is divided by 7,000. All right, so I'm going to do this on the calculator. Okay, I get a big decimal. If I round it off to three decimals, I get 0 0.875. Really, we should have done the units as well. But since we did not change any of the units, we can just stick with the original units on the pressure. And that was kilogram per square centimeter for pressure. Okay, so the pressure units are kilograms per square centimeter. So that's part B. All right, I'll leave this one for homework. It says the resistance of a copper wire carrying an electrical current is directly proportional to its length and inversely proportional to its cross-sectional area. Okay, so this is a combined, and it says the resistance. So this side here is going to be the resistance. All right, we'll just call that capital R. And it says it's directly proportional to its length. Okay, so the one that's directly proportional is the one in the numerator. So for length, usually we call that lowercase l. 
And finally, it's inversely proportional to its cross-sectional area. So the one that's inversely proportional is in the denominator. Okay, so that's going to be the area, capital A. All right, so then plug in the numbers. Let's write out this equation. The resistance R is going to equal K times the length L. And as far as the area, they're talking about cross-sectional area of a copper wire. Okay, if you sliced a copper wire, the cross-sectional area or the shape is going to be a circle. All right, and we know that the area of a circle is going to be pi r squared. So in place of the area in the denominator, we're going to have pi r squared. Now, you need to use this equation to solve for K, so you can write the equation with a value for K. They give you, they give you the diameter. So you have to use that to take, to find the radius, okay? The radius is going to be half of the diameter, okay? So you have to take half of that value to find the radius, then find the area, and you need to use that in the equation, okay? You want to solve for K and then write the equation. Once you have the equation, you can do the follow-up question to solve for the length, okay? You use this diameter to find the area, and then you use this resistance in place of R. I would do it algebraically first, like we did the last problem. Solve for the length L first using algebra and then plug in the numbers. All right, so for joint variation, Z varies jointly as X and Y and it's proportional to both X and Y. Okay, so this equation here, Z equals KXY is going to be variation. And as you can see here, both the X and the Y, so X and Y have direct variation. They are directly proportional to Z. All right, so the simple interest for an investment is jointly proportional to the time and the principal. All right. So for joint variation, we just said a minute ago, that's going to be Z equals KXY. All right, so the simple interest is going to be your Z. All right, I'll just write INT for interest, and we'll use a capital I for Z. All right, and it's jointly proportional to the time and the principal. So we'll let the X be the time T. All right, that's going to be a lowercase t. And we will let the Y be the principal. All right, that's usually going to be a capital P. All right, and it says after one quarter, three months, the interest on a principal of five grand is 43.75. Write an equation relating the interest principal and time. Okay, just so you know, the time is usually in years. All right, so let's plug in the letters first. So the interest is capital I, and we have K. X is going to be the time T, and the principal is going to be capital P. All right, so in order to write the equation, like they say in part A, we need to solve for K, as always. All right, so let's see. It says here, after one quarter or three months. So the time is going to be three months. 
But we said that time is supposed to be in years. All right, so since there's 12 months in a year, the time is going to be three twelfths of a year. All right, and it says the principal is five grand. So the principal is going to be $5,000. And it says the interest is $43.75. So the interest is forty-three seventy-five. All right, so we're going to use those in the equation to solve for K. Pretty simple. Okay, so we can plug in the numbers, or we can do it algebraically first, since we're going to solve for K. I am going to divide. We have K times T times P. The opposite of times T is divided by T. The opposite of times P is divided by P. So we do that to both sides. And it cancels here. Okay. So the interest I, we said was 4375 in place of I, 4375. The time T is 3 twelfths. All right. We can write the fraction 3 twelfths, but 3 twelfths is 1 fourth which is actually the same as 0.25. Whoops, I wrote a zero here. It's the same as 0.25. So I think that'll be a little easier to put in the calculator. So for time t, 0.25. 3 twelfths is the same as 1 fourth. And the principal p we said was 5,000. All right, that's gonna be the value for k. So let's do this on the calculator. Okay, I get K equals 0 0.035, so I am going to use that value for K to write the equation. All right, this was the initial equation before we did the algebra. It was I equals KTP, so that's going to be I equals K, which is 0 0.035 times T times P. So that is part A, the equation for the interest. Okay, part B, find the interest after three quarters. Okay, so the time T, three quarters is the same as three fourths of a year. All right, so let's find the interest. We have 0 0.035, and that's going to be time t, times t. We said t was 3 fourths. I am going to use 0 0.75 instead of 3 fourths, so that's going to be 0 0.75. And the principal p, the initial amount invested, uh, I believe that didn't change, so use the principal of $5,000 once again. So in place of P, we're just going to use 5,000. All right, simple calculation on the calculator. All right, I get 131.25 exactly, and of course the units are in dollars for interest. All right, so this will be the homework. The kinetic energy E of an object varies jointly with the object's mass and the square of the object's velocity V. All right, so the joint variation, we said that's going to be Z equals KXY. Okay, it says the kinetic energy E, so E is going to be your Z. And it varies jointly, so that's why we have this equation. K, we don't know. It varies jointly with the object's mass, M. So one of these variables is going to be M. And the square of the object's velocity. Okay, so the other variable is going to be V, but it's going to be the square of the velocity. All right, so that's the equation right there. And then you're going to use the other given uh, numbers to solve for K, so you can write the equation. You're going to plug in a mass of 50, 
and you're going to plug in a velocity of 16 meters per second and you're going to plug in the kinetic energy of 6400 solve for k write the equation and then answer the follow-up question with a mass of 70 and a velocity of 20.